Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Freedom Papers, powered by Turning Point USA, hosted by me, Morgan Zeggers, your favorite history nerd, and my favorite little co-host, Connor Clegg. How's hey it going? Great to be here. Happy Friday. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Yeah, I appreciate course. it. I really enjoyed having him last time, so I was like, will you please come on again tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how it went. Well, so thank you for making time. Course, it, we're filming this on a Friday night, yeah. and you could be doing other things, but I think this is a wonderful thing to be doing. Um, today, we're moving out of 1 through 10, and we're moving into paper 11. Now, 1 through 10, Connor, did you know that like 1 through 10 are considered the more philosophical right, right. Uh, argument for why we should get a union, why we need the Constitution, yeah. and why we should join together? Uh, number 11 is the first one that really gets technical. And so that's why I'm also glad that I have Connor here because he's really good at talking about this specific subject and honestly just American strength on the world stage. That's really what this is about. But technically, number 11 is about forming the Navy. And at the time, back in 1787, this was to really strengthen America's presence on the world stage for commerce, for trade. And by doing that, they would kind of swipe out the enemies at the knees and, and start to take dominance of the world stage. And I think it's really cool to hear it because, hey, look what we did. <laughs> right. We made it happen. Um, nowadays, that's what we're also going to talk about is, oh, uh, do we still dominate the world stage, Connor? <laughs> oh, no, it, we, we don't. It's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, but so it's okay. a lot is going on we'll right now. But title of number 11 is called The Utility of the Union in Respect to Commercial Relations and a Navy. So we're going to talk about America's Navy. This is kind of the starting point of, of talking about should we get one. And, of course, I've had in the Navy stuck in my head ever since I read this paper for this episode. So I'm really excited to talk about it. But it was written by Hamilton, another Hamilton one. He wrote a lot of them. He wrote a lot of them. Now, let's just get right into it. I have one quote that I'll start Do with, it. Connor, and then I'll pass it off to you. But Publius says, there are appearances to authorize a, su a supposition that the advantage Adventurous spirit, which distinguishes the commercial character of America, has already excited uneasy sensations in several of the maritime powers of Europe. And I loved that because that's that was the vibe back then. Put yourself mm -hmm. back in 1787. America just defeated a world power for to win a revolutionary war. And now we have all of this land that we just won power of, basically. And then, yes, France and Spain and England had their little colonies all throughout. But... Everybody was like, wait, something really, really serious just happened that's going to totally shake up the dynamic worldwide. And they knew that America had the potential to grow into something. And so that's what it was really considered when the founders were talking about this is the adventurous spirit of America. And our, our enemies at the time were jealous and also very nervous. And so I'll pass it off to you, Connor. W what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And the other thing that uh, people don't really or at least we take it for granted today. America is very unique in the sense that we're bordered by two oceans on either side of us, right? Europe didn't have that distinction at the time. They were all interconnected. They were able to get anywhere they needed to go in terms of an invasion, uh, largely over land, right? Um, America has this natural fortification called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So if you wanted to get here, you had to come overseas. Uh, and that presented a really... Um, strong geographic military advantage for the United States in terms of defense. So it did worry a lot of people. They said if America latches onto that spirit, which later became known as the, the manifest destiny of America, right, then they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And for generations and generations, we very much were. And I think that's what we're going to get into is uh, the question is, is that still the case? Yeah. And Connor, you weren't here for this, but I did the uh, Federalist Paper number two solo. Mm -hmm. And I explained to everybody that it's my favorite paper. And so if you haven't watched that episode, I encourage you to do it. It's pretty much my favorite one that we've done solo because mm -hmm. I've done a, quite a few of them now. But in paper number two, it's it's just a very beautiful. There's a lot of pretty language. Right. Alexander Hamilton's a great writer. It wasn't Hamilton. It was Jay, but he was a great writer right. in this. Um, and what he says is basically the land that is America the navigable waters mm -hmm. and the beautiful, the beautiful fertile soil and, and everything about it, the land and the people were brought together by providence. And so sure. I just want to read that for people who maybe haven't seen that episode yet. Publius says, Providence has in a particular manner blessed it with a variety of soils and productions and watered it with innumerable streams for the delight and accommodation of its inhabitants. A succession of navigable waters forms a kind of chain round its borders, as if to bind it together, while the most noble rivers in the world, running at convenient distances, present them with highways for the easy communication of friendly aids and the mutual transportation and exchange of their various commodities. With equal pleasure, I have as often taken notice that Providence 
Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs, and by who, oh, and who, by their joint councils, arms, and efforts, fighting side by side throughout a long and bloody war, have nobly established their general liberty and independence. And then he finishes by saying, this country and this people seem to have been made for each other. And it appears as if it was the design of providence that an inheritance so proper and convenient for a band of brethren, united to each other by the strongest ties, should never split into a number of unsocial, jealous, and alien sovereignties. And of course, there he's making the case of why we should unite and why we'd be stronger together, why we should form this union. But when you take that same principle of, wow, look at the opportunities we have here with this beautiful land, this soil, all these waters that allow us to have this kind of commerce in the future. The founders then take that into paper number 11 and they say, we can't let this go to waste, but we could also use it to our advantage. Well, yeah, totally. Uh, That always makes me think of, um, I was actually telling my friend Olivia before we started this, I was reading over uh, number 11 here, which like you said, is one of the more technical ones. But even in the way that they talk about these kind of technical things, it's still beautiful. I mean, just uh, there's a sentence here I highlight. I'll, I'll find it later. But um, mm-hmm. I wish people still talked like that. And, and Federalist Number 2 is one of the best. It's one of my favorites, too. Uh, it also makes me think that even before people got here and kind of inhabited the land, I think of uh, uh, John Winthrop was his name. And he was riding over on the Arabella, um, a, a beautiful ship at the time. And he got to the shores of America and he described it as a shining city on a hill you know, touched ordainly by providence. And this word providence keeps popping up time and time again every time you look at our founding documents and the the people who wrote about America in the earliest days. Uh, And it's such a poignant idea because if this is is a divinely inspired land, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that conservatives by and large also agree on, right? This isn't just, you know, a piece of land that we are to kind of rape and pillage for our own, you know, benefit, but it's something to be admired and respected and used to our benefit in a way that actually conserves it for a greater good. Because again, it is providential. It is bigger than all of us. So it's beautiful. I'm so happy we're here. What yeah. a great country we have. Right? Well, and, and I think a lot of conservatives, I'm sure you've seen this riff in our, our side mm-hmm. uh, between the people that are more DC political types that have always had that, well, America is a concept, an idea. Right. And now you're having people like us, I think, that are standing up and saying, no, we have borders. We, we are a piece yeah. of land. We are a country. And yes, we have unprecedented ideas rooted in freedom. And though that is exceptional in many ways. But you have to combine that idea that is America with the land that we actually Actually are or else then yeah. then what is it you know right. and so that's what it really struck to me I don't know if you saw uh, recently so the longest speech on the floor of the house right of representatives Kevin yeah. McCarthy I was watching eight, it eight hours and 27 minutes I, think. I, I was up and I was I'm a grandma so I'm usually yeah. like in bed at 9 30 but I have the live stream playing in bed yeah. and I I'm watching it, and he kept saying America is an idea that needs to continue an <laughs> idea that needs to continue and while I'm very against the idea that or I keep saying idea, but while I'm very against the concept that we are just an idea, right. I think he was so spot on with what he was saying in the sense that if we pass this Build Back Better plan, if we continue down this road, if you guys continue to disrespect our documents, mm-hmm. we are no longer going to have the one country that has this, these principles existing. We, right. we, we're finished. Right. We're finished. Yeah. We're weak on the stage. And he always talked about China. And we're going to get that in we're gonna get later. To China. But, ugh. Yeah, no, and just one final point in the land, this Build Back Better thing that you brought up. Um, The progressive, and progressive is such a silly word for this, (laughs) language matters, right? Um, And progressive is is not, they're not, they're not progressive at all. Very progressive, but we'll get into that at a later point. Um, They want to do all these things for the environment, right? And I was driving to California recently. California is one of the most beautiful states in the entire union. And it pains me to say that because it's been totally ruined by leftist policies. Um, And I'm going down Highway 8 on my way to San Diego. And I'm thinking, golly, this is just absolutely gorgeous. And then you get to a certain point where these windmills pop up, right? And there is nothing uglier than a windmill. I know President Trump used to do this all the time, and he went on this long riff about windmills and birds. And the, but, but I mean, genuinely speaking, those things are just disgusting to look at. And by the way, very distracting. I have ADD really, really bad, and I'm driving down the road, and they don't want distracted drivers, so don't look at your phone, right? But you're driving down the road, and imagine here's, here's the road right here, and then all of a sudden there's just this giant spinny thing, right? You're going to look at that. You're going to watch it. And then, boom, 
drive right <laughs> off the road. Okay. I didn't do that. I'm here. But well, anyway, thank sorry. Thank you for your insight. We'll, we'll go back to the Navy now. But um, yeah, I, I don't want to see these people destroy our country because I do think it's beautiful. And I, I, I work very closely with Charlie, obviously, and I love Charlie to death. But we kind of went on this journey together, ideologically speaking, um, and I think a lot of conservatives did, frankly, mm-hmm. where there used to be this argument that was popularly made. Charlie never really made it. But there was this argument that was always made that like, yeah, of course we can have all this legal immigration. Look, go fly over the West, right? Go fly over the American West. Look at all of our land and tell me that we don't have room for more people. Okay, what are you going to do? Play, you know, build, a, build an apartment building on, 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 in, in Yellowstone? You know, are you going to go put condos in Big Sur? Are you going to duplexes along the Grand Canyon? No. I mean, we have to take care of this beautiful providential uh, land that is much more than an idea. It's physical. It's tangible. It's objectively beautiful. And we've lost sight of that because we're so focused on um, something that is, is, is not, you know, permanent and good and objectively right. So we got to get back to there. And these guys knew what they were doing. And uh, I'm glad that we have a strong military and a strong Navy to help us defend this beautiful country. Yeah, well, and that's it's hard for, for me now. to read these papers because everybody's so optimistic in the papers. I, I mean, know. these guys are fighting over, look at, we have this amazing, <clears throat> unprecedented opportunity at our fingertips. Let's not right. ruin it. And now we're in a situation where we had it all. Pretty mm-hmm. much. I mean, let's, let's be we real. We had it all, We man. had it all. We still have the opportunity to continue sure. to have it all. And there is an opportunity for us to fix it if we look back to these documents. But now we're in the situation of we aren't saying, oh, look at this opportunity we have. No. Let's not spoil it. Instead, we're saying, look what we're losing right now. And it almost seems like the other side is saying, look at this opportunity that we have to spoil it. Like they have a a well plotted out driven agenda to actually do everything that they can to, you know, just ruin the country. And it's almost like they're doing it intentionally. I hear people say all the time from kind of the older wing of the party or the the movement rather, um, not to call anyone out by name, but it's one of the most popular think tanks in D.C. and um, they have a long heritage. But uh, it, it seems as though they would rather just, you know, populate everything with these, you know, Google factories and Amazon warehouses in every every corner of, of our country just in the name of the free market and enterprise. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're a, we're a country with a market inside of it, not a market with a country that belongs to the market. So Yeah, well, getting back to that mindset yeah. of what they used to be in of building something, mm-hmm. I, I thought it was really interesting to hear how scared the world powers were of America in 1787. Oh, yeah. So Publius says, those of them which have colonies in America look forward to what this country is capable of becoming with painful solicitude. Right. <laughs> they, As they, should. they were hurting on the inside thinking of what could potentially happen to them. So uh, what I loved about this paper, and I hope you guys again read this, because Hamilton is basically digging in and digging in saying, you guys, we could really seize the opportunity and cut them at the knees. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to say, impressions of this kind will naturally indicate the policy of fostering divisions among us and of depriving us as far as possible of an active commerce in our own bottoms. And and I didn't really hear this term before. I don't know if you've heard the active commerce versus passive commerce. But active commerce basically means as a country, you're deciding your own trade. Okay, you're in control of it. Uh, When you're passive commerce, it means that a country is telling you how much you're about to be paying in taxes to get goods from them or to land your uh, ships in their ports to, to really do anything or operate in the international economy. Right. And so you want to be in active commerce. Right. And Hamilton was saying, how do we do this? And the more we pursue this, it means that our enemies are going to also get aggressive with us. So he says, if we continue united, we may counteract a policy so unfriendly to our prosperity in a variety of ways. Suppose, for instance, we had a government in America capable of excluding Great Britain, with whom we have at present no treaty of commerce, from all of our ports. What would be the probable operation of this step upon our politics? Would it not enable us to negotiate with the fairest prospect of success for commercial privileges of the most valuable and extensive kind in the dominions of that kingdom? And so not only is he saying, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunities here, but it was kind of a little greedy in what he's saying. And and I I like it. I'm not saying that he should be soft. But instead, He's got this aggressive mentality of not only could we succeed on our own, but we might also be able to stop a world superpower from leading on the world stage from our own home base. Like we don't even have to like go over to England and stop right. them and take power from them. We could take power from major European countries Without just ever by America. like having more power in our own com- uh, right. commerce and trade here and telling them that we're going to control their trade, stopping them from making as much money. And it's going to have this domino effect mm-hmm. on the world stage. And so they're kind of putting the pieces together and what he gets to Connor Mm -hmm. 
As he says, a further resource for influencing the conduct of European nations towards us in this respect would arise from the establishment of a federal navy. Right. And so it's making the case that we could control not only commerce and trade and economic power, but political power, all from our home base here on America, if we are able to dominate in trade. The only way we can dominate in trade and commerce is if we have a federal, a national navy. And right that's when we start to get into that conversation. So I honestly, I didn't know that this was the birth discussion of the U.S. Navy. And, and I, I am always interested to hear where these things come from. Yeah, it's, um, well, think about it. So we were the colonies at the time. And whenever the revolution happened, they, they all traveled over to us. So the Marines had formed at the time um, of the revolution. We obviously had the colonial army from which the, the, the current U.S. Army stands. We didn't have any need for a Navy though, right? So it was never something that had to be thought of before. But once we won our independence, then it became fairly obvious that there had to be something to defend us. And so um, you realize really quickly, and this was kind of the genius of Hamilton and the Federalists, was that that becomes impossible to do if we're just going to be kind of this um, disjointed union of smaller confederacies, right? So think, think about it this way. If how would a uh, landlocked state, right? Like, uh, I'm trying to think at the time in terms of the map, right? What would be a landlocked state? Well, that's the thing. I think all of them were touching the water. Vermont. Ex except for a couple of them New that Hampshire. were considered like territories. Right. And so most of them were touching the ocean. Right. And that's something that he touches on in the paper is like pretty much everyone here is going to have to make a navy if we're separate yeah. states or for many confederacies. Right. Everybody has some sort of connection to a great body right. of water or the ocean or a river, and it's going to lead to massive conflict well, internally. Of it is. Yeah. I mean, like, think about it. You know, if, if, if we saw that conflict kind of come to a head. And, and I remember during the Civil War, there was actually this experiment where the South tried to do um, their own kind of version of the Navy, and they just got absolutely decimated because he gets into this later, and I thought it was actually really interesting because we don't think about these things mm -mm. in terms of our modern industrial world, right? But the fact that the South had stronger lumber by which to build ships, but then there was iron in the North, and the people who were more apt at navigating the ships um, and captaining them and, 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 and filling the roles on them, those mainly came from the North because they had the experience in uh, whaling, right, for example, uh, and just having a more, you know, economy that was based around, you know, going out in the sea, lobstering. Lobstermen in Maine are still, a, that's the massive constituency up there. So the, the folks up there knew how to drive the ships. The folks down here knew how to build the ships with stronger wood. And that could only be achieved through cooperation. And, and the Navy was one of the, the first instances where we saw this great cooperation between the entirety of the regions of America, the, 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 new, the new beautiful country of America. Uh, and they came together and they did something that was bigger than themselves. And... Uh, obviously, that has sustained to today. And uh, that's an exciting thing because uh, the Navy, think about it, has been one of the foremost um, worldwide operations in achieving global peace, which in a globally peaceful world, you have a um, domestic, tranquil nation. And um, we're starting to stray away from that because we have surrendered this idea of standing up for ourselves and actually like having this passive idea of uh, not only commerce, or excuse me, having this active idea of not only commerce, but uh, an active idea of defense. And um, we have to figure out a way to get back to there. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the next part that Publius says mm -hmm. is is kind of talking about the privilege that comes with, with neutrality. Right. Like it, the natural course of things is that you get attacked. Like human history sucks. That's something human that I nature. say a lot on this podcast. Human nature is that people are greedy and people are self-interested. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always lead to good things. Right. And so if you are weak, if you are not strong in your defenses, if you're not going on offense, if you aren't respected as a power – you're going to get attacked. It's, right. it's just that's what history shows. And so Publius says a price would be set not only upon our friendship, and he's talking about if we became dominant in trade, but upon our neutrality. And so right. people would want to please the United States. Right. They would want to be friends with us. They would pay more for our goods. They would be interested in pleasing us in all these ways, politically, uh, via our government or via trade and the economy. It would be for our friendship, but also just so that we don't attack them. Yeah, they, exactly. they would want to just like make sure that we don't go bother them because right. then we are the strong people. And so there's a privilege that comes with being able to be neutral. 
And so he says, by a steady adherence to the Union, we may hope ere long to become the arbiter of Europe and America and to be able to incline the balance of European competitions in this part of the world as our interest may dictate. The rights of neutrality will only be respected when they are defended by an adequate power. I loved that quote. Right. A nation despicable by its weakness forfeits even the privilege of being neutral. Under a vigorous national government, the natural strength and resources of the country directed to a common interest would baffle all the combinations of European jealousy to restrain our growth. This situation would even take away the motive to such combinations by inducing an impractical an impracticability of success. An act of commerce, an extensive navigation, a flourishing marine would then be the inevitable offspring of moral and physical necessity. We might defy the little arts of little politicians to control or vary the irresistible and unchangeable course of nature. And so kind of that last sentence, I don't know if you guys noticed, the little politicians. Hamilton gets a lot of credit for his his words that he specifically chooses. Mm -hmm. And there he specifically did mean to call the opposition to his beliefs little politicians because he wanted to, you know, make a little fun of them and to kind of delegitimize them in that way of it's just those little politicians over there. The same that, that we make sense of like... We little Marco, of, right? Yeah, Isn't like we make Marco? fun of like the little bureaucrats in D.C., yeah. you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so like we make fun of the little bureaucrats in D.C., and that's kind of what Hamilton was doing there is playing a political game by right. saying his opponents were just little men that were arguing behind microphones. But uh, again, I love what he's saying there. Of, right. of We can control European and worldwide politics if we can get this together on trade, but the only way that we're going to do that is if we're united and we have a strong Navy. No, yeah, that's exactly right. And And Hamilton, kind of without saying it, um, said something that I thought was really interesting as well. With the victory that we achieved in the revolution, we saw kind of the first crack in the British Empire, right? The, they used to say at the time, the sun never sets on, on, on the British, on the crown, right? Um, and Hamilton was was seeing something here because he uses this line that would baffle all the combinations of European jealousy to restrain our growth, right? Mm. He saw what was happening in Europe. He saw that there was revolutions happening in France. I mean, there was this massive fracturing happening over there. So... It was kind of this instance where in politics, this is a principle that's always existed, whether they knew it or not, um, because American football didn't exist at the time. But John F. Kennedy had a great, a great quote uh, where he said, politics is a lot like football. Um, you get the ball, you see a gap of daylight, um, and then you have to sprint through that hole all the way to the end zone. And Hamilton's saying, hey, guys, we have an opportunity right here to seize the moment and take advantage of the weakness of Europe right now because they're in a very baffled state. Um, and pick up on something that's going to be really, really strong, and it ended up being strong. So, absolutely. Yeah, and and you kind of touched on this actually a little bit earlier with the idea of the differences in mm-hmm. strengths between the North and the South, and that's what Publius gets into next. Yeah. So Publius kind of starts to talk about the internal waters, the lakes, the rivers, specifically the Mississippi River, um, inside of the Union that could lead, again, to conflict between the states. And we covered that a ton in 1 through 10, you guys, right. of what could potentially lead to conflict between the states and then the consequences of that. And that would be the domestic and foreign consequences of that because not only would we be fighting and constantly warring with each other, right. but foreign powers would be like, right. oh, that's an opportunity for yeah, us. Obviously. And so very very dangerous. If you are still not getting it, definitely go watch those previous episodes. Um, but what he's talking about is exactly what you said, Connor, is there's a lot of resources in the South, like the harder wood to make the ships. Right. And then there's the more experienced marine people who mm-hmm. can do uh, the controlling of the ships in the North. Um, but what he's also saying, it made me think of just think of America today like West Virginia versus California sure. versus upstate New York where I'm from right, and the people in the cities. Every region and area of the United States is different mm-hmm. and we were very much brought together by water for a long, long time well, before be. the highway systems were created and everything. I mean, before the railroads and I'm from upstate New York where that was like early settled, you know, like oh, yeah. there, there's a ton of old school buildings there. And the Erie Canal, Mm -hmm. the Hudson River, that's all of that is a canal system. And you can still do it. I go through the locks quite often, but it's not needed much anymore unless we're getting some trade from Canada. But it was made completely or almost completely irrelevant by the creation of the highway that is now like a mile off of the canal. And so at the time, the ability to use water to navigate was was crucial. Publius is saying, why would we argue and put ourselves in a position of arguing over these great assets if we could use them as assets Mm -hmm. 
why would we do that if arguing would just lead to us fighting over those assets, the, the ability, the right to the water? And it would also limit us from being able to produce things, right. from being able to grow as a nation. So it's, right. it's like we're going to cut ourselves off at the knees if, right. we, if we take this opportunity away from this. Yeah. And there's a reason why, you know, all of the most uh, or all of the major cities nearly in the United States are situated at these, you know, waterways and ports and things like that. It's because they provide a natural inherent advantage. Um, and that's why you see the most powerful states in America are Texas, right? Um, California, Florida, New York, mm. right? And it's all because they share this common denominator of having access to um, importing and exporting through waterways. I mean, think about it, the first um, millionaire, I think, in America, right? The first uh, magnate of business and um, capital empire was, was Cornelius Vanderbilt, who they called the Admiral, right? Because he had the, 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 the wisdom and the providence to kind of seize upon this idea that, look, I can make a lot of profit and a lot of money and a lot of betterment for the nation because we had uh, patriotic-minded entrepreneurs at the time. I'm going off track here, but it's no, fine. No, it makes sense. It, it comes back, right? I but love like, that nerdy stuff. Yeah, but like it, 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 our business magnates, the very first idea of, of, of business and prosperity in America came from a guy who realized that waterways were the most important thing to have um, dominance over. Yeah, and so Hamilton was touching on something really important here, and uh, no, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. I love the stories of, especially the Industrial Revolution. Oh, yeah. John Astor, I think he might be mm -hmm. the first millionaire, Probably. and then Vanderbilt and all these guys, and of course they're villainized. I, yeah, a lot of so people wrong. ask me because I'm just so into the history of socialism and communism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's it's a passion of mine because I love economic independence. Right. It it economic independence really gives you true freedom because you're not reliant on the state. Of course. And, and that's so important if you want freedom in general. Right. Um, but it made me so sad through all of history class in public school, your, your 20th century education is learning about the terrible situations of the, the Industrial Revolution. The robber barons is what they call them, right? It's just such a dark period in history class. Yeah. And instead, it's like, why is it not taught as the beginning of the end of world poverty, basically? Totally. Because at that moment, as they start teaching all the doom and gloom of the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution, they fail to address, like, guys, the moment this started, it was the beginning of 90% of worldwide poverty being Going eliminated yeah. in the next 100 years. Right. It's fascinating when you actually look at the statistics. I saw a funny thing. You, you would like this. And it was like uh, my politics or whatever this is. And it yeah. was like a poll, a thing of the worldwide GDP. Just right. like yeah, going, of course it is. <laughs> it's like my politics or whatever that graph right. is. Um, but I'll <clears> get into this again. Uh, so Publius says a navy of the United States, as it would embrace the resources of all, is an object far less remote than a navy of any single state or pa partial confederacy which would only embrace the resources of a part. And so that right. kind of summarizes what you and I were talking about. And again, a big part of this essay, you guys, is Publius saying if we are three or four confederacies, if we are multiple states, almost every state or confederacy would touch an important piece of water that another area or confederacy wants to control or get right. access to. And it's n absolutely going to lead to conflict. Yep. So that was a big part of it. Um, next up. Publius says, a unity of commercial as well as political interests can only result from a unity of government. And, and I thought that was really uh, a very simple phrase, but yeah. I wanted to just address it for you guys that, that yes, you have to have a, a coordination between your values wh when that's in terms of economics, finance, politics, and government as a society. And my favorite definition of capitalism a lot of people will be like oh capitalism is like greed and all all these things you know that nobody really knows what it is but right. my favorite definition of it is from glenn hubbard from columbia university mm -hmm. and he says it is an individual's a person's an average schmuck like you mm -hmm. and me our ability to participate in the economy have a business uh make money have financial and economic power basically right. not just the government right. but it's not just that it's also a system of government, a system of public policy, and a system of justice and law that protects that individual's ability to have those rights. And, and that's what I love. It's a two-pronged system. You can't just say, well, yeah, it's somebody's ability to buy and sell a good. No, it's their ability to live in that society and freely do so. And what happened over the 2020 riots, Connor, that principle was just yeah, ab 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 abonish. Yeah. Now, what happened is because all these small business owners, all these people that put their heart and soul mm -hmm. into their businesses, mm -hmm. 
all of a sudden it's burned down and they're told, oh, well, it's just property. And, right. and property isn't as valuable as our seeking of justice. And it's like, no, no, no. We live in a society where that person is willing to spend all that time dedicated to building that business and making that sacrifice to grow in the economy yeah. because they trust that their system, their government will protect their ability to right. do so. And now our government is failing us. Yeah. It's the basic contract that we signed by paying taxes, by being good citizens. And now we're being let down at the most basic level. And that's I think that's what really struck a chord with a lot of people is like, wait, I put all my effort into this and you're gonna let some random person burn it down? What's the point of growing it then? Yeah, and I'm just I'm just supposed to say, okay, well that's that's reparations, right? That's what they tell us, right? Yeah, that they can go into a Louis Vuitton store and I think AOC said, right? There well it's just reparations. They just wanna try and feed their family, right? Yeah, because you can eat a, a Chanel purse. You know, get out of my face, right? <laughs> no, people don't know this often, uh, and I think it's one of the most overlooked parts of the entirety of the founding documents is that the original draft that Thomas Jefferson put together at the Declaration of Independence was um, that we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the original draft didn't say pursuit of happiness. He said property, mm. right? Because the right to private property is the most important, quite frankly, of all Western ideals, and what we saw during 2020 and what I'm afraid that we're going to start seeing again soon now that riot season is kind of kicking kicking back up again, turns out, right? Which is weird because usually you do it in usually the spring and summer, down, yeah. but now it's cold out and they're still yeah, going the, out well, and doing the, it. Maybe so. the fires will warm everyone up. But um, <laughs> it was just a terribly, terribly dark joke, but my God. But yeah, when we lose the right to private property, we we lose our autonomy as human beings to pursue happiness. So if we all agree that the pursuit of happiness is an inalienable right, that becomes impossible to do without private property. Um, and conservatives have to start talking about this a lot more and, and do, doing a lot more d deep thought about these things, right? Because it, it, and it goes back to sovereignty of the individual within the sovereignty of a nation. It's like if you don't even have a right to your own dominion, um, then you really have nothing. Then we're just reduced to animals, right? Yeah. Because what what is an animal? The animals don't have private property, right? Yeah. They, they, you can take a monkey's banana and there's nothing they can do about it. Hmm. Um, we should investigate why it was taken out. Do you know why property was taken out? Because I think that it was inferred. That that's that's kind of what the 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 uh, the scholarship on it all says is that they didn't think that that needed to be explained. So they wanted a more broad term such as the pursuit of happiness. But the pursuit of happiness assumes that you have the property which will enable you to pursue it. And I'm not necessarily just talking about land or businesses or but like this th this is my property, right? Thomas Jefferson's quill was his property, which allowed him to write the Declaration of Independence, which allowed him to, you know, what enumerate this idea that we have inalienable rights. If someone took Thomas Jefferson's quill, we don't have America. It's very, very basic stuff. And that's the, th the thing is, is the founders were like, well, that's assumed. We don't necessarily need to spell that out. But the problem is we're getting way away from that. Yeah. And what is and conservatives are talking about this all the time. I'm really glad that they are. Um, because it should scare the pants off everybody. The um, oh, what is it? It's it's the it's this great reset idea of um, the great reset who, where they say you're gonna, you're going to you're going to own nothing and you're going to be happy. You're going to enjoy it, right? And Charlie says this all the time. Like we have to stop as conservatives being okay with these like land developers and stuff building upwards and not out. And you hit it on the uh, on the head all the time when you talk about the homesteading thing because if you build a condo and you build an apartment building. The majority of those are not owned owned by you, right? They're owned by someone, you know, either overseas or you know who has no real vested interest in them, and so you don't develop this this care for ownership of anything, right? Yeah. And um, we, when you don't care about time. anything, then why would you ever give a damn to protect it? Exactly. And that's the thing with these businesses; they build something, right? They built something more often than not from the ground up. Things that have been there for years. They're they're cultural institutions in their communities, mm -hmm. and we're just supposed to agree with the AOCs and the, and, the, and the squads of the world and say, well, human life is more valuable than property. No, they're actually on yeah. the same level. Well, because when do you get to the next step? And a lot of the lefties, I don't want us to go on too long of a tangent because we're right, getting right, right. into like commie land. plenty to talk about here. And we can do that another time. But like, yeah, now leftists, they'll say, well, Morgan, you're talking about personal property. You can still have personal property under our version of communism, just not private property. And I'm like, no, no, no I don't like what? your definitions. I don't like your manipulations of anything. Yeah, What's mine is mine. I deserve a, an ability to have things without you taking them and right. saying it's in the name of justice or whatever it may be or destroying them, whatever. Whatever the hell right, that it really is. cuts it takes out the dignity and and you guys 
Publius says the Constitution is supposed to be the best way to guarantee our liberty, dignity, and happiness. That's exactly right. Um, so let's finish up the paper, Connor, because yeah. I think we're on the last page. And then I want to talk a little bit about the current state of the country and, of course, commie China. Mm-hmm. Back to communism again. It's 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 almost like it's a theme that Maybe, it's on the right. rise. Right. <laughs> Always the at top of mind for Connor and I. Um, so I'll just finish off with Publius's statement because it is a strong one you guys so he basically goes after europe and Mm -hmm. this as a history nerd and you said that you like to kind of hear this stuff too connor i love hearing the quarrels back then the mindsets that the founders were in and this is the mindset of the founders right now they said unhappily for the other three europe by her arms and by her negotiations by force and by fraud has in different degrees extended her dominion over all of them Africa, Asia, and America have successively felt her domination. The superiority she has long maintained has tempted her to plume herself as the mistress of the world and to consider the rest of mankind as created for her benefit. Men admired as profound philosophers have in direct terms attributed her inhabitants a physical superiority and have gravely asserted that all animals and with them the human species degenerate in America, that even dogs cease to bark after having breathed a while in our atmosphere. Facts have too long supported these arrogant pretensions of the European. It belongs to us to vindicate the honor of the human race and to teach assuming brother moderation. Union will enable us to do it. Disunion will add another victim to his triumphs. Ugh. Let Americans disdain to be the instruments of European greatness! Exclamation point. Let the 13 states bound together in a strict and indissoluble union concur in erecting one great American system superior to the control of all transatlantic force or influence and be able to dictate the terms of the connection between the old and the new world. Publius. Oh my gosh, Connor, how cool is that? Did you know we did it? I know. <laughs> how that, cool that, is that? That was the sentence I was telling Olivia about. I was like, I wish people still talked like that because that was beautiful. But I want to... I think it's important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I didn't do the last time. I'm going to go through and I'm going to read something one more time if that's okay. okay. Is that I okay? I would love that. Right? So, unhappily for the other three, Europe by her arms and her negotiations by force and by fraud has in different degrees extended her domination over them all. Africa, Asia, and America have successfully felt her domination, right? Who does that sound like today? It sounds a lot like China, right? Mm. By force and by fraud, and especially when they bring up Africa. And when they bring up America, and I'm not, think, I'm not talking about in terms of uh, our continental United States, but think of the Americas in general, South America specifically. So China right now, and I think this is the perfect segue, they have something that's called the Belt and Road Initiative, right? And the entire idea of that comes from um, what Europe used to do specifically, um, uh, Great Britain at the time, right? They wanted to extend their domination over – China is the, is the modern empire. They are to the current times that we live in what England was to the times that Hamilton lived in. And the thing is, is that our leaders at the time recognized the threat that that was. Hamilton clearly did, and the rest of them came around to it, right? I don't know that the leaders of our time are recognizing that threat at the same level. And if they don't start to, then we're going to face a fate that Hamilton was just passionately and beautifully and aggressively trying to avoid, you see it with the exclamation points, right? Um, Yeah, he doesn't overuse those. He does not. And when he does, that's, that's, that's a big deal. So yeah, China is not just a competitor. They're not just someone who we should um, try to beat. No, they're our mortal enemy. They're everything that is evil and wrong and dark in the world. And it's no coincidence that they're communists. Um, and if we don't start waking up to the threat that they pose to us and start taking all of this more seriously, especially our Navy, and that's what I want to talk about here, if we don't start taking our Navy seriously, if we don't start taking our military seriously, if we don't start taking our trade seriously, especially our trade, uh, then we're going to lose all of the beautiful things that we talked about at the beginning of this episode, right? All of the beauty of our nation, all of the beauty of human dignity, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, well, that's the thing. Sad. It's not like it's our best friend over there that's, uh, now they're kind of our frenemy. No, and yeah. we would hate to go to war. We would hate to have conflict with them. No, these people run concentration camps. Oh, yeah. These people are disgusting. 
These people are horrible, and yeah. they're not somebody, a, a group of people that we want to align with. And again, we mean the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, okay? We don't mean all Chinese people, just for any lefties mm -hmm. out there that want to start lying about what we say again. That also really disgusts me. With COVID, that bothered me so much that we were trying to call out the CCP right. for the atrocities that they did, for lying that COVID spread from person to person, from lying to the entire world. And every time we did, leftists in America would say that we were against Chinese Americans. Right. Hello, pretty much all the Chinese Americans here were oppressed by the CCP. That's why they're fled here. Fled the country <laughs> and then came to America and hate the CCP. Yeah. And so none of none of it made sense. Any young kids listening out there, I know that you don't learn about China enough in high school. Okay, I know you don't learn about it. So please come to Turning shame. Point for resources. Please come to Connor and I and this uh, this podcast because it's not a, a good country for us to align with. But Connor, great connection between yeah. the fact that Europe had its hands in everything back then. The founders noticed it and said a world power has to rise up and cut it off. Yeah. And now that's the case where we're not seeing that these days as China's doing it. What happened, I mean, most recently, we can look at with COVID-19, of course. And somebody, Angelo, on our team brought a really good point up. Of, what was it? The aircraft carrier that right. was right so the USS Roosevelt in the South China Sea, it was the only carrier there. So that means it was the only one that could really like uh, pu pull, put up a threat to communist China, we right. should say. And uh, there was a whole debacle right at the start of COVID. And it was just a little too coincidental. Did you remember that? Yeah, I mean, the, the details of it are, are a little hazy. But I do remember that that was one of the first things that started to send off these little red flags, right, in my mind that said, Ooh, something bigger is going on here, right? With China and Wuhan and this pandemic that uh, I think at the time we all kind of had this really good idea that it came from China. Now we definitely know, right? And all of the all, all roads lead back to China on this. Um, but that was the first thing that said, ah, there's a there's, there's a bigger game at play here, and we should start being a little bit more curious about it. And President Trump took that cue and he ran with it. Um, and of course they called him a racist or whatever. But yeah, it well, was and so it's wrong. important for us to address too. So a lot's been going on. Obviously, the CCP we deal with now is the same CCP from 1960s, 70s, 80s, right. the Tiananmen Square massacre, the one child policy. Uh, th really disgusting stuff. So it's not like that was the history, this historical China of, right. oh, the 20th century, and it's a different one now, yeah. Mao's Cultural Revolution. Yeah. It's literally the same it's regime. It's all the same, right. So don't let the history books <clears throat> distort you because sometimes they're not factual. Don't let the teachers lie to you or the professors lie to you. It's the same regime that we're dealing with. Now, right before COVID happened, Connor, mm -hmm. you know this, there was the Hong Kong protest where right. millions of people were speaking out because they did not want to get put under communist Chinese control. Sure. And they were speaking out and protesting. And what do you know? Yeah. COVID-19 comes. Well, and now so, we can't gather in crowds, right? So you can't protest anymore. All of a sudden, that whole situation got wiped out, unfortunately, mm -hmm. after they arrested all those poor people, yeah. a lot of them young students. Them. So then this, this U.S. aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. yeah. all of a sudden, the only one that's in the area, near Taiwan especially, now it's got all these COVID cases hmm. on it, and it's got right. to get quarantined. It's got to get all this stuff happened to it. But then China starts flying over Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Just un nothing's <laughs> happening to them then. You got the Silk, what is it called? The Silk Belt? The, the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and right. Road. I'm, what am I, I think I'm the well, Silk the, Road. The, that's what, it, that's what <laughs> it's, it's modeled after. It yeah. follows the same path. Okay, so the Belt Road Initiative is following the historic Silk Road. That's right. where I'm getting it confused. Right. And it basically, what, it goes for all the way from Asia to the Middle East. It goes from Asia, and then it goes, well, they haven't finished it yet. They want to, right? Yeah. That's, that's something that they're working on. Um, but it goes from Asia all the way through China, and then it dips down, I believe, into India, and then it goes back up through Pakistan, uh, and then it takes its way down into um, Africa, okay. right? And then they also are starting to build um, uh, hubs of it, uh, if you will, in uh, South American uh, countries and states. So uh, Venezuela is seeing that. I think Ecuador is seeing some of that. Could have some of my countries wrong here. But uh, but yeah, it, it's it's all about they're, they're trying to – they are playing a game of active commerce, right? And if we don't start to perk up an active defense posture against that, then we are – we're going to fall victim to it. Yeah, because it's and Chinese brings, domination of the world. That comes with the next step. What happened next after all this COVID crap? Right. Afghanistan. Yeah. And China was hoping for something mm -hmm. like this to happen. And of course, Afghanistan has a terrible history. Any country that tries to invade that place ends up failing. And so the a graveyard lot of, of empires. Is a what lot they call of it. a lot of historians are like, well, what's going to happen now that China's getting right. its fingers dipped in there? But China just paid billions of dollars to the Taliban mm -hmm. in exchange for basically mineral resources, right. and and like uh, it's going to benefit China quite a lot. But the Taliban just got billions of dollars from communist China. And 
On top of that, we left how many millions, billions of dollars? $85 billion dollars worth of equipment. All this equipment they talk so beautifully about here in Federalist 11, um, it's much more modern now, obviously, and we just <laughs> left it to them. So that's, it, that's what it. hurts so bad, reading this paper, because it's saying – if we are going to win in trade and commerce and politically mm-hmm. worldwide, you have to have these certain things. And not only are we losing in trade and commerce, I think China just it just announced that like we're losing. China's now the richest nation in the world, by the yeah. way. They took they took over the United States on that. So, so that so, just great. got announced. Um, Congratulations. On top of that, you have Afghanistan back where better, we left right? eighty five billion dollars of equipment. And what happened with the Taliban? They take the equipment, they give it to the communist Chinese. Yeah, not only the communist Chinese, but the communist Chinese are then going to give that to uh, North Korea who is our enemy as well, not to mention, right? Uh, then Russia also shares a border with Afghanistan. So who else is getting it? Putin. Who is Putin allies with? He's allies with uh, Mao, or excuse me, Xi, right? <laughs> Freudian slip. Same difference. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a really, really bad situation. What is the United States doing in response? Well, of course, obviously our response is to go and christen the USNS, the US naval ship Harvey Milk, right? Because that's what a strong nation does. We name ships after pedophile, sexual anarchists like Harvey Milk, right? And who better to christen it than some transgender whack job with a champagne bottle, you know, and send it off into the sea and like, oh, we're going to go fight China. No, we're not. We're going to lose. China just banned sissy men and we're naming freaking ships after Harvey Milk. Get out of my face. We need to get back to the days. You brought up the USS Roosevelt. We need to go back to the days of Theodore Roosevelt, who that ship I think was named after. It might have been named after as much... Uh, weaker cousin FDR, right? But Theodore Roosevelt had something called the Great White Fleet, right? Yeah. And his philosophy in terms of uh, foreign policy, and this is obviously, you know, everyone, it's very popular, speak softly, carry a big stick, right? So what Roosevelt did was he took these beautiful American ships and he painted them all white, like stark, beautiful white that mm. just popped out on the blue seas. And he didn't do anything with them, but he just sent them on a, he sent them on a circum, uh, glo- Cut, I don't cut know that. Who. I don't know the hell. He, he sent him to <laughs> circumnavigate the world, right? Okay. Um, and what it did was it just reminded everyone at that time, hey, America's here. We're not messing around. Don't screw with us or else. And he never attacked anybody, yeah. right? But he made sure that people knew that we were a force to be reckoned with. And I can guarantee you, as China is sitting over here and the CCP is banning sissy men, which they did recently. Did you see this? They're banning the portrayal of sissy men on TV and in publications, and uh, they're stopping their kids from playing video games and all of these things. And we're naming ships after Harvey Milk, and we have Rachel Levine. Don't worry, everybody. She's going to be our savior. He's going to be our savior, right? The first transgender admiral. Well, I heard that they're all, they're getting a military masculine training. Also, they are. Kind of, I, I've got to say, Connor, I don't know if I'm even allowed to say this, but I worry not. constantly – a little, maybe too much, or maybe I'm a normal person for worrying about this, but I worry that my children that I already love so much, don't even have them, right. um, that they're going to be drafted into a world war with, with communist China. Well, yeah, and not even women are going to be safe because in the name of equality and gender equity, they're going to be drafted too, which is, and, and you know this, and I don't have to explain this to you, but for the, the fake media that's probably going to listen to this, women are incredible at a million different things. But when it comes to fight a war, we shouldn't be just indiscriminately drafting a woman in the same way that we're indiscriminately drafting men. Men are formulated in a way that makes them more capable, inherently stronger, more mentally, you know, fortified to go out there and face the the dangers and the evils of war. And I love women, obviously. Y'all are much better at a million other things. I promise you're much smarter. You're much, there's, I can go on, but we don't have time for it, right? But we shouldn't be drafting our daughters into war. And I'm scared too, because I want to, I want to have daughters someday. And I don't want to see anyone drafted into war because it's avoidable. It's so damn avoidable. And we spent four years under President Trump putting America first is what he called it. And everyone said that's just a slogan. That's just a campaign theme. No, it was an ideology. That's up there with that speak softly, carry a big stick ideology in a way that like I don't think we ever appreciated until now because all of a sudden you've got you know, General Mark Milley and, and General you know, Se- Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin – who are two of the most just generally unimpressive people I've ever seen in my life. I mean, Mark Milley couldn't do a push-up to save his life. Lloyd Austin went to, uh, where was it, some overseas country, and he wore this like dental shield or whatever, and it was like, <laughs> and, and, and double masks underneath it. He's so terrified of a virus with a 0.2% you know, mortality rate that he's going to cover himself up in like nine different layers of protective clothing. And we think that China is scared of us? 
Of course they're not. They're... An invasion of the United States is going to happen soon. I promise you that. If it doesn't come from, you know, China, I can guarantee you that it's going to be financially backed by China or supported by Chinese military strength or, or, or something to that effect. Yeah. So well, if we don't start taking it seriously, I mean, we're, we're in big trouble. Well, I, I heard a lot of uh, military guys that were higher up and they they've addressed like we weren't in at war with Afghanistan when we were over there. We were in a cold war with China. Right, of course. <laughs> like, that that's what it was. Yeah. Because it's it's the same way when you look at what Hamilton. It's kind of crazy when you look at what these guys were saying in the Federalist Papers. They were saying that people with countries with mm -hmm. their own interests mm -hmm. were going to see that we were fighting and they were going to come fight their own wars on our soil. Obviously. And they were going to do it for their own interest. Yeah. And so I would always say, look at what's going on in Af uh, Afghanistan in the Middle East. Look how many foreign countries are involved there. And right. Really, they couldn't give a crap no. about the girls and the women there and right. the civilians and everything that's happening to them. Well, clearly um, we don't either, right? I well, mean, we, oh, we're, yeah. we're letting them get bought and sold now. It's disgusting. There's a reason why they call Afghanistan the graveyard of empires. Everyone has always wanted Afghanistan because it, it represents one of the most strategic positions in the entire world. I'm not a neocon by any stretch of the imagination. I promise you that, right? But there is something to be said about maintaining a, a U.S. presence that's strong enough to deter a foreign invasion of Afghanistan. I don't want to see people die there. I don't want to see a permanent occupation of it necessarily. I think that we needed to get our troops out, yeah. but there's a way to do it, and we failed at that as a nation. Yeah. And we should never, ever, ever let that let anyone get away with that. These people should be held accountable by military tribunals for what they did. I mean, it was just utter, gross political arrogance by a decrepit old man who simply wanted to secure a legacy that he's never going to have because he's just embarrassing our nation at every turn. Yeah, well, it's it, that's happening, and you have it's not even just President Joe Biden. Yeah. It is the mentality of the radical left. So people say, right. oh, are we going to get to impeachment? Are we going to get him out? No, it's no matter Doesn't who matter. is in now, anybody on that side is now advocating for defunding the military, looking from a weak position on all world issues right. and they hate America. They don't want us to have a strong person. No, like they don't they want don't. us to have a strong presence on the world stage because they hate our presence to begin with. Of they course. don't believe in what we stand for. And so when we talk about moving forward, I, I was watching the um, Kevin McCarthy speaker or no, now he's not speaker majority or minority minor leader. my gosh, I'm sad. Minority leader, Kevin McCarthy right. was giving Soon his, to be speaker. <laughs> his filibuster speech. And he was saying, I was just at this, you know, this D day, um, memorial. And I couldn't help but think, and I'm sitting there with my friends, colleagues in the mm -hmm. house, and they were sitting there saying, you know, what could have been done to prevent the loss of life that was here? What decisions in the decade, five years, two years leading up to these moments could have changed and saved these people's lives? W would it have been a different political decision? And now he's saying what we do over the next few years is going to be the same situation if we don't stop it. And his entire eight hour speech, Connor, was about preventing hostility with China, ending Good any potential Kevin. suffering in the future by making better decisions now. And of yeah. course they still passed the bill. Of course they yeah, still went forward with it. They passed it today. It's disgusting. But when we talk about having strong military presence, it's not because – honestly, I'm fine with having a strong military presence. I'm fine with us controlling like Bagram Air Base and all this sure. stuff in Afghanistan because it's it's like what Teddy well, we Roosevelt it too, did. Right? It's, it's what Teddy Roosevelt said, you know, speak – what it speaks speak quietly. Soft, speak softly and carry, carry a big, a big stick. stick. Right. And so if we have a strong military presence, we are – protecting ourselves not only from hostility but we're also just securing neutrality exactly. we don't have to attack anybody but we're securing neutrality a lot of that comes with the navy specifically with china and the more our political decisions disappoint us mm -hmm. and fail our military mm -hmm. the more we're going to fail the more our economy is going to fail and it's just going to be this downfall of the great american republic that we once were that's what is so so sad our founders wrote these saying look at the opportunities here let's build the navy and now you have half the country saying they want to defund the military as our economy is collapsing and we're about to go to world war with communist China. Isn't oh, yeah. that great? Oh, yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, what don't you have? What, what's not to be optimistic about, right? And I, I don't want to end this on like the cynical note, but I mean, people are going to die. <laughs> it's not fun. That's the thing is like, and I didn't mean to say it's, that. No, no, it's laughing, like, it's, it's, but it's not it's, funny. It's not funny. To it, all the radical like, leftists. Yeah, they don't care, but they're the humanitarians, right? But no, I mean, if, if we don't start waking up and saying this is actually going to lead to a massive loss of life. I mean, not to mention, first of all, COVID is an act of war as far as I'm concerned, right? And the fact that we're even engaging in trade with China right now is disgusting to me, right? 
the fact that we're even having conversations with the Chinese president, that just happened very recently in the White House, right? It was virtual, but nevertheless. To me, that's the equivalent of inviting Adolf Hitler into a summit with the, with the, with, with Truman would have never met with Hitler, right? FDR would have never met with Hitler. None of these people, because that is the, 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 the level of evil is equivalent. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, I'm sure, but if not more, right? If not more, because the thing is, is that what's happening right now in China is the most egregious abuse of human rights. It's the most egregious empire building strategy that I think we've ever seen in the, in the history of the world, right? And we've seen some pretty big empire builders, you know, uh, Alexander, Napoleon, King George, et cetera. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, of course, right? But these are bad folks, folks. And they are going to eat our lunch, to, to, to borrow a phrase from our beloved leader. Um, and the fact that we're not, you know, doing a full boycott of the Olympics, just a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics in Beijing, right? It just seems like at every turn we're trying to capitulate to them just to appease them, to keep them happy. I mean, we're giving what, Nord Stream 2? That, that's a Russian pipeline. But like Russia and China, if you don't think that they're interconnected, then you're not paying attention, right? We're giving away the farm to our enemies in the name of securing peace. That's what they do it for. The American people are being gaslit into believing that if we just keep giving them an inch, that they're not going to take a mile. But the naivete of our leaders and the arrogance and the willful disregard for human suffering, it should make all of us sick to our stomachs. It should. Now, I, you hit the nail on the head there. I cannot fathom every time I see us diplomatically meeting with or talking about or participating in trade with communist China because I see the communist regime, mm -hmm. the CCP, mm -hmm. and the same level as Nazi Germany. Yeah. And the one lesson I'll give, I'll give public school well, credit for a little thing. The one lesson that they definitely hammered home is that the problem with World War II oh, is yeah. that all world leaders of the <clears throat> Allies appeased, appeased, appeased Hitler and appeased Nazi Germany right. because they Neville just didn't want problems. Yeah. And I would say it's even worse right now because not only don't we just not want to upset anybody, but we're like, oh, yeah, give us the money. Corporate oh, America's yeah. like, oh, we don't, we don't even oh, want to just not upset you. We are getting rich off of this. Biden yeah. and Nancy Pelosi and Eric Swalwell and Fang Fang, Fang, Fang. <laughs> they are loving their relationships with communist china yeah, that's what makes right? it even worse and <laughs> don't don't make me laugh but to kind of close this off i mean we're, we got to get back to the navy yeah bring get back. back to the navy bring it back it. to the navy now i know a lot of great navy men and women sure. thank you for your service god bless I'm, you honestly i love the historical tidbit that this is how the navy came about in america we built the greatest Naval forces in human history, I mm -hmm. think we still have access to them. That's the thing. The men and women in our armed forces are fantastic. Of course they are. It is political decisions, and it's also what Publius and Charles Kessler, who wrote my favorite version of the introduction to this, um, he basically says – the American people, if they're not enlightened, if they don't have basic understanding of these principles, then they're not going to be able to rationally consent to right. these principles and rationally and enduringly consent. And so that's the core problem. We have an unenlightened American public. And so then we elect leaders that are, Who are completely crap. Deeply unenlightened. And then our people and our leaders do things like say, we don't we don't need to fund the military or America's bad. We can we can, you know, sim for commie China, all this stuff while we have the amazing men and women in our armed forces who are just kind of like hands tied. It's like Benghazi, but just in an extreme way, they're just sitting there being told you can't go in. It's for diplomatic nope. reasons. Yeah. So that's how I see it. Right. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. I know it upsets a lot of members of our military forces because they feel helpless. They feel hopeless. And they feel like they deserve more support. I think they do, too. Uh, but thanks for joining us, Connor. Yeah, do you have thanks. any last, any closing remarks on the Navy and on our international power so that we can preserve trade and safety and security? No, I mean, God bless the Navy. God bless all the members of our armed forces. We say this all the time on the show. It's uh, it's the suits, not the boots, who get us in trouble. And Ugh, I love that. That's uh, that's what we're looking at right now. Do you now. say that on the Charlie Kirk show? Is that what yeah, we say it about the about the deep state, FBI, oh, all those folks all the time. The suits, but it's not the boots. But it applies to all this as well, right? So um, if we don't start seeing a change in mentality of our leadership, and we see a resurgence of political will to actually stand up for what matters, what Hamilton knew mattered back in back in these days, uh, yeah, you're, we're we're going to lose it. So 
Time to wake up, America. No, honestly, I, I love seeing the connections between now and then. Um, we can turn it around. I think we can. Oh, we've got the resources. We we've got the assets. We've got the people. It's truly just our political leaders. Um, but you guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Freedom Papers. Sorry we went on a million tangents, <laughs> but I had a great time with you. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Follow us at Freedom Papers Podcast on Instagram and get your own books, people. You better be reading so that you come prepared for next episode. Thank you, Connor. Amen. Thank you, Morgan. In the Navy, <laughs> you can sail the seven seas. Mm-hmm.